welcome, welcome, welcome to the Journeys webcast. I'm Alan Carl, your host, and I want to thank you for tuning in. I really do appreciate you, those of you who are repeat viewers of this and those of you who come for the first time because of our guest or you just learned about it. I do really um, appreciate and uh, that you do choose to take an hour or so out of your day to hang out with me and uh, my guest. So um, really appreciate that. Hey, so um, it's Monday and it is Journey's webcast day. And you know, this is my favorite day of the week because I get to travel virtually in the crazy times around this world and spend time with somebody interesting, inspiring and um, cool and, and that. And, and if you didn't see last um, weeks, it's actually two weeks ago, we took an off week last week, um, Vanessa Ruck on International Women's Day. This is a replay you definitely want to go back to and watch because she is a badass um, and really, really cool. It was a fantastic interview. So I want to do that. A couple quick updates before we bring Chris on. This is going to be so cool today. Um, you know, we all know that I'm um, still, for those of you who are, I can see so far we've got 40% uh, of people tuned in right now have uh, been to Journey's webcast before. And we have... Um, uh, or, or have never been here before. So thank you for, for choosing to spend time with us. And 60% uh, of you are uh, recurring visitors. I love that. Um, that. So there's a poll on the side. So for those of you coming in, and be sure to uh, use the chat room. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Ah, And I can see Chris is already using it. See, he's he's hanging in the green room right now. Hey, um, for those of you who haven't been here, um, and for those of you who have, uh, I, I do have been since June battling a little bit of this crazy vertigo, and it's still going on. I'm not going to go real deep into it, but it seems like it's a, a recurring theme at the opening of the show. It's just to kind of let you know how I'm doing. I seem to be having more bad, <laughs> no, I'm not having more good days than bad days, but still, when the bad days come, it just kind of feels like you're taking two steps backwards. So, that's that's the other thing. The other crazy thing is, you know, still in this lockdown and this sort of quarantine state here in my little cottage down near San Diego, uh, I'm always doing a lot of things, running around the house. I'm, I've been cooking a lot, you know, in this COVID time. I, I, I've just really found my uh, passion for cooking reignited. Um, I mean, I always had it. But anyway, last Saturday, a week ago Saturday, I'm doing something in my office. I've got something cooking on the oven. I'm running back and forth. And in this crazy, fast Alan running around, I slam my toe in this door jam to, to the hallway here and uh, wake up the next morning in excruciating pain on Sunday and find my way to the, um, <laughs> to the, to the express care. And turns out I broke the pinky toe. You know, why is it always that the littlest appendage, the littlest digit, hurts so much when you injure it. So anyway, I, uh, and this is when you really know that you've, um, uh, you, you've spent, uh, uh, you got too much time on your hands as a result of uh, not really being able to travel or do, do things. So there is a, um, there, there is a video uh, I made, it's on my YouTube channel about this whole broken toe um, incident. So anyway, Check that out um, if you wish uh, over there. But the other thing I wanted to uh, share with you, if I can kind of f pull it up here, um, and, and real briefly, uh, a few years ago, 2015, I spent a month with a film crew in China um, working on the TV show. This is before we actually shot the pilot for uh, the Travel Channel that, that we filmed in, in Baja that ended up airing. And unfortunately, it never evolved into a full series, but uh, they, the Scripps Network, owner of the Travel Channel Food Network and the HGTV and all that got um, merged that week my show aired with the Discovery Networks. And everybody working on my project got shuffled around and my project got lost in that mix. But that footage we shot in China for that month long journey has never been seen. And I've recently reconnected with the film crew, with the producer, the showrunner, Paniotti Yanitsis, this Canadian, uh, who's now a very good friend of mine. And we've decided it's time that we, we had a little bit of falling out with some other people involved in the project. So that footage stayed on a shelf for a long time. And I wanted to, before I brought Chris on, um, just give you a little teaser of, of what 
what's to come. And I, I think you're going to you're going to like this. So watch this for a second and uh, I'll talk about it on the back side and bring Chris in. Disaster. Okay. And now cool. We're, listen, now we're recording our conversation, Alan. Let's go. dusty little town I've got to get to somebody who can help me I've taken part the bike looking at the cooling system just wondering exactly what might have happened I knew it There's a little bit of an abrupt ending to that. Okay, there we go. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Chris Gillibu. Um, he's a modern day explorer and a New York Times and Wall Street bestselling author of, 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 of a lot of books, but the $100 startup, Side Hustle, The Happiness of Pursuit, and so many other ones, including his latest, The Money Tree, that I'm going to talk about with him today a little bit uh, as well. So during a lifetime of self-employment that included a four-year commitment as a volunteer executive in West Africa, he visited every country in the world. That's right, every country, 193, before he turned 35. His daily podcast, The Side Hustle School, is downloaded more than 2 million times a month. He is also founder of the World Domination Summit, an event for cultural creatives that attracts thousands of attendees to Portland, Oregon every summer. Chris's first book, The Art of Nonconformity, was translating into more than 30 languages. His second book, The $100 Startup, was a New York Times and, as I mentioned, the Wall Street Journal bestseller, selling more than 700,000 copies worldwide. His newest book, that's right, The Money Tree, is all about finding the fortune in your own backyard. Um, he has modeled the proven definition of an entrepreneur. Um, someone who will work 24 hours a day for themselves to avoid working one hour a day for someone else. So I hope you will go to uh, chrisgillibow.com and subscribe to his newsletter. Chris, come on into the room. What's up? Hey. Hey, hey. hey how's it going? Hey. Thank you for having me. Well, Thanks hey, so thank much you for that uh, kind introduction. I really love seeing the, the footage from China as well. It's pretty cool. Oh yeah, I you know before we even get into any of that stuff, I I want to I want to talk about the 193 countries. You know, I I mm. I thought I was cool. You know, I've been to eight, <laughs> but uh, but you really you really did it at a very young age. Um, I, I I might even call you, and and we'll talk about how your you know brand, if we want to call it that, how you have evolved as a person. Um, sure. And, you know, you, you could be called the original travel hacker. Um, and, you know, before it was trendy, before even nobody really used that mm. term. Um, tell us how you did it and what the process was. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, I mean, when it comes to that kind of stuff, you know, like I, I wasn't trying to be the, the fastest person to do this or the youngest person. And, 
a lot of people like yourself and probably some of the folks watching, they've had incredible travel feats and, you know, adventures of their own. So, you know, for me, it's always just like, what, what is my personal goal? What am I trying to, to do here? And so I had, had spent a few years living in West Africa. I was an aid worker there. And through that experience in my early 20s, I, I one, kind of gained an appreciation for different cultures and just uh, a love of immersion and appreciated as well, like the challenge and complexity and, and the adventure of um, going to different places. And so it's comfortable with travel. And then um, I just kept going lots of different places and spent some time in Eastern Europe and Asia. And finally, at some point, I guess, as it was getting closer to my 30th birthday, that's when I was like, maybe I should turn this into some kind of goal, you know, and that was even before it was a project, you know, it was just like, you know, my personal goal of trying to go everywhere. And probably about halfway through is when I started writing about it uh, on a blog called The Art of Nonconformity. And that kind of changed my life as well, you know, just like the, you know, time in West Africa changed my life. Uh, starting the blog changed my life in a different way because all of a sudden what was very just private and personal, my own thing that I was doing um, kind of became more of a community. And there were people in all these different countries who were reading and other people who were kind of cheering me on, you know, to the, the finish line. And everything I've done since then is kind of, um, you know, an evolution of that or a different adaptation of that. Uh, it's all work for this, for this community. Uh, so I feel really fortunate. You know, I feel really fortunate that I can do what I want to do for the most part and I'm able to travel at least, you know, when there's not a global pandemic that's taken over <laughs> everything. Um, but yeah, I, I feel really fortunate that I can connect with amazing people even now in the global pandemic, uh, thanks to technology. Thanks to technology. Yeah. Right. You know, I got to tell you the, that how I learned, because we've never really chatted about this, about how I first learned about you. Because you you and I, you know, you had started a blog, you know, back in the late 90s or early 2000s. You were you were a travel blogger then, as I, mm -hmm. as I was. I think my first mm -hmm. blog post was in 1999, before people knew what the word was. Um, mm -hmm. And I was, I, you know, in, in many ways, so I, I, people know a little bit about my story, but um, after I had uh, uh, traveled around the world for three years, I did a three year, mm -hmm. other than having a broken leg in the middle of it that interrupted mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. When I came back, I knew that my purpose um, was not to just keep these experiences in was to share them. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, um, so I, I was in the process of reinventing myself. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I ran into somebody, I got involved in the National Speakers Association. So I was, I was mm -hmm. starting to speak. That was one way I was mm -hmm. sharing these experiences. And a woman who I did a presentation came up to me after mm -hmm. and said, wow, you know, do you know Chris Gillibo? And I mm -hmm. said, mm, no, should I? And mm -hmm. she says, well, you, you seem like, mm -hmm. you, you know, like, like him, you should know him. And it was at that point I went out. Uh, it, your book had must have just come out that year, or or it was it was around 2011 when I had this um, mm. this little conversation with this woman, and and I think what inspired her is, and this is what I want to talk about how how you are. I mean, for me, I had quit my job at the company I started, mm -hmm. and then I just started another company because it was what I did. Um, yeah. but, but something was missing, um, mm. so so I decided to travel for those three years. And I came back to started speaking. This was long before my book, you know, and mm -hmm. I had the, um, I was, um, you know, it was great that I had an opportunity to speak to audiences at Apple, Google, and even the, um, mm -hmm. what was that one? Oh, the, the BCMA, the Biscuit and Cookie Manufacturers Association. <laughs> Damn, they, they never called me. They never called me. So I'm going to put that on my list. Yeah, you should. This is good. Once we can get events going back again. And, right. and after okay. I... After I would do my talk, and, and I think this is where this woman said that, people come up to me, as I'm sure they do you, and they always would say, oh, wow, Alan, I wish I could do what you do. Mm -hmm. And and my my answer was always the same. Well, you can. It's just that you need mm -hmm. to make the choice. You know, the decision right. part's the hardest part. Doing it's not mm -hmm. hard. There's nothing special mm -hmm. about me. And, you know, so I, I look at you, Chris. You not only mm -hmm. chose what you want to do, but you've been – you've spent a good part of the last 20 years showing people how they can do what they want to do and live a life that they kind of can design. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I know you've been a, a lifelong entrepreneur, but um, 
and you you talk about originally in the art of nonconformity. Mm -hmm. uh, did you call it life planning or something like this or mm -hmm. life? Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, forget something like that. Yeah, and and so this was a bit more organic, or was it designed? It was a hundred percent or uh, organic. I could never say it was designed or strategic or this was like my business plan. Um, I I just I said yes to opportunities that were exciting, you know, and I tried to focus on the next thing, like whatever the next thing was. I didn't know I was going to go to every country until I'd been to, I don't know, maybe 50 countries, you know, and then it was like, hmm, you know, maybe I could go to 100 countries, you know, before I die or something. And I start working towards that. And then I'm actually, how many countries are there? 193. Okay, let's, let's go to all of them. And then everything else that came after, you know, like you mentioned about, you know, helping people and showing people how to do stuff. I mean, really, it's just, I'm just sharing stories, you know, I just share stories, I share tips, you know, examples. Uh, when I was doing more travel hacking stuff, it was like, you know, how to use frequent flyer miles, you know, in creative ways and such, how to get around the world plane ticket. Uh, then I started writing more about my entrepreneurship stuff. And, but I'm just, I'm just, all I'm doing is like, not really starting anything. I'm just um, hope, hopefully amplifying other people's experiences so that still other people can see those experiences and say, oh, maybe I can, maybe, maybe I don't connect to Chris or to, you know, anybody else, uh, you know, who seems far away from me or something or somewhat removed. But here's a story of somebody who's just like an ordinary person. And like, I, I could, they can do it. I can too, you know? And so I guess for me, like the empowerment part of it has all been, has always been very central to it. You know, I'm not a very good travel blogger. Like you said, I started with travel blogging, but I learned pretty quickly. I'm not really good at that. You know, like other people, do a much better job than me at like showcasing the the beauty and cultural, you know, highlights and, and immersion of a particular place. Um, so I learned pretty quickly, like I'm better at writing about process and uh, reinvention actually to use that word that you used. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just one thing builds to another. So you don't have to necessarily know where the end is going to be. I certainly didn't, but I don't know now, you know, <laughs> yeah, who, who knew even even with this pandemic where we would be going? Right, and where exactly. are, and didn't where plan are for that one. Didn't yeah. plan for that. But as soon as the pandemic ends, my number one thing is the biscuit cookie manufacturing association. People always ask me, "Where do you want to travel to?" As soon as things end, now I'm going to have a good answer for that. So. Now you now you know exactly because because yes. this, this this could change your life. <laughs> the <That's> good. <laughs> I got, I, got, I wrote it down. I did. I love that. I love that. Um, you know, c c coming to the, um, I, I, you say something actually. I wanted to come back since we're in the in the pandemic. You wrote on your blog on your blog that you've been social distancing distancing a lot longer than the pandemic. <laughs> right, I'm a lifelong social distancer. I'm like, wow, the world has come around to me. You know. <laughs> yeah, you're a lifelong social distancer. This this is. Uh, is, I mean, I'm an, I, I'm I'm an introvert. You know, like I just mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time by myself. I don't mind that. It's not like I'm a misanthrope, you know, I like, you know, I just go out and do community events when I'm able to do that. And that's always a lot of fun, but I also am okay, you know, spending a lot of time alone, which, which is good. I think if you're traveling independently, you know, to have that skill, or if you're working remotely, you know, if you don't, yeah. if you're, if you're not working in a corporate or organizational structure, um, you know, it's good to be somewhat self-disciplined in that way. So for me, this is, this is very normal. You know, a lot of the stuff that we've kind of all been through, I mean, not a lot of stuff with the pandemic, but I didn't have to adjust nearly as much as a lot of people did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that that's a good point. Uh, I always have said that if you're not comfortable with yourself, how you mm. expect to be comfortable among others and, and right. yes, being alone is tough. Um, mm. And, and especially, you know, when you're kind of in, when it's kind of forced upon you, I mean, you can retreat mm. yourself when you make that yeah. choice, but then all of a sudden you, you have to mm. do that. Um, in, in, in your, you, you've you've done a, a lot of great writing. You know, you've written uh, several manifestos, kind of um, mm -hmm. things rule. Not I won't call them rules, but but uh, <laughs> outlines for how to live um, mm -hmm. a more meaningful, purposeful life. And mm -hmm. and one of the things that always that that that, that I remember, and, and it's and it's always been part of when I do a keynote and when I've written articles mm -hmm. about this, is about being open and. Um, mm -hmm. And being open to new ideas, and, I, and sometimes I, I used a metaphor about people, how, how we get closed-minded when it even comes to food, you know, mm -hmm. harboring harboring uh, flavor sentiments that you had maybe when you're eight, but yet you know when you're 28, yeah. you know, you're, 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 you change. I, I'd love yeah. you to to talk a little bit about 
the importance of mm. being open and mm. how that sits in with your, your processes that you, you yeah. do. And people. Well, it's one of those things that you have to always, you have to constantly be thinking about it. You know, it's what it's like, I'm like, what do I think about when I hear that question? I'm like, Oh, well, yeah, it's, you know, to reinforce that lesson about being open. But I think, you know, then I have to ask myself, how am I being open to new ideas, you know, or am I just kind of open to the same ideas I've been kind of putting forward or exploring myself for a long time. And at one time they were open, but you know, at what, at what point did they kind of become less open, you know? And so I think it comes down to, um, you know, one exposure to different points of view or exposure to different, uh, you know, experiences and, you know, making sure you take some time when you're traveling or when you're not um, to kind of go beyond what you would normally go through, you know, whether, again, that's whether you're like, you know, out and about somewhere or whether you're just, you know, reading news online or something. Um, but then the second part is the first part, is just like, you know, making that openness in terms of your mindset and your behavior. But the second part is just always asking yourself, what do I, you know, what do I want? What am I learning right now? I think that's a question I've been asking myself over the past year. What am I learning? Because I realized, like I used to kind of say that I was a lifelong learner and that just seemed like a smart thing to say at one point. It's like, I'm a lifelong <laughs> learner, you know? Um, and then I, I started thinking, I was like, I, I, have, I have always been a learner. Like I can think about in the past about all the things that I have learned. I can think about all the books I have read, you know, past tense. Um, but what am I actually learning right now? You know, once I realized that I was like, oh, I need to create, I need to make some changes in my life rather than just telling people to be open, you know? Um, so I started like, making learning more of a daily habit for me. And there's so many online courses, you know, you can watch these days and just about any topic. And so I started going out to learn more about blockchain or whatever the topic is, you know, and, and um, it's been very good for me. And I just realized it's easy to get away from the habit. I guess that's the point is like, it's easy. Like once you start thinking open-mindedly, you're like, that's great, but you got to, it's a constant thing like exercise or something. Otherwise you end up just kind of getting stuck. Yeah, it's like practice. I say the same mm. thing about change. Make change constant mm. in your life because otherwise, yeah. if you're not, right. you when change hits you, you'll be kind of broadsided. But if you make change mm. as part of your life, um, right. change things up, mm. whether it's moving mm. your furniture around in your house or taking a different yep. route to work. You know, there's there's ways mm -hmm. to, to make don't don't fall into that habit. Good point. Um, yeah, yeah. The 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 other thing. Um, you know, of, of fear, you know, I've, I talk about, well, being open, trying new things. And, and, uh, mm. and, and I wanted to talk a little bit about fear because fear plays mm. into that, especially since a lot of your work is telling people how they can uh, create a life for themselves by becoming their own boss, or maybe pull, you know, creating a side hustle that's going to give them the extra money mm. that they, they want for whatever it is. But, but part of the, there is this, uh, this notion, and you talked about it on your, on your podcast on Friday about, about how, how failure should not fall into you, any of your fears. And, and mm -hmm. I thought that was really good. Um, mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to choosing to do something new. Mm -hmm. I mean, failure should not be one of your fears. I mean, I think we always think of failure as like a potential outcome for something, but I, I tend to think it, it, first of all, if there is no chance of failure, then I'm risking nothing, right? Like the stakes are very low and, and, you know, it's not good either because I need to be challenging myself. I think I think challenge is really an important part of our of our lives. You know, anybody mm -hmm. who's interested in in travel, you know, can probably connect to that. Um, but I guess you know, I also see, I also think about risk a little bit differently. And there's a perception that when you are doing some of these things, whether it's going out and about around the world or starting a side business or something, there's a perception that this is kind of risky behavior, like fundamentally risky and I've always seen it as actually the opposite. It's like, this is the conservative, this is like the safe path, you know? I'm encouraging everybody to follow the safe traditional path, which is ironic, right? Because it's all, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. counterintuitive. Um, but I really believe the best thing you can do for yourself is to, you know, like look out for yourself and like invest in yourself over time. And, you know, economically, like you're gonna be able to support yourself better than a company could support you most likely. And, uh, or even if you work for a company, there's a way to, you know, think like an entrepreneur, even within an existing structure um, or whether it's travel or something else. So, you know, failure of course is, you know, possibility. Like when people say failure is not an option, again, it's like, all right, if failure is really not an option, then maybe you should expand your thinking or your, your, your practice. Um, I think failure is always an option. Failure is always yeah. an option, but yet 
you know, so many other exciting possibilities out there. And also like if it's a, if something goes wrong, it goes wrong, you know, it goes, and then you adjust and you do something different. You know, you hear these statistics all the time about like the number of small businesses that fail every year and, and there's never any context behind them. It never says like, oh, you know, so-and-so's so -and -so's business failed, but they actually just got a better idea and they decided to try something else or their business worked for years you know, and was profitable and, and supported their lifestyle. And then something about that market changed or something. And then they had to do something else, you know, but is that really a failure because it actually supported them for, for years? So I just try to think differently about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, perspective is, is always good to have in that. And, and for, for every failure that you may have, but whether it's just something small in your life is actually one step towards success. I mean that, you know, that's, this is one of those kind of, um, common themes of self-help people right mm. you know or mm. sales kind of thing you know with sure. rejection is one step to a um to a mm. sale but uh, and um i wanted to go over to our chat we have a few people we got spinovich from mexico city nice to have you there i i you you, you and i just exchanged some things on um on facebook so thank you for tuning in chris foster a friend of mine, another uh, world traveler um, from from Lucadia. He's a neighbor of mine. And Lee, I think you're out in. Uh, you've been on here before. You're in. You're in Phoenix or Phoenix or Tucson. You're in Arizona, I believe. If I'm not right, maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm missing that. But thank you. Tune in. I know there's a lot more people um, in the room. Say hello if you've got a question for Chris. Uh, bring it up. I, I'm going to come back to the travel because we're going we're going to talk a lot about. Uh, um, startups and hustles and things like that in a minute, but I want to, you know, you know, the, the, the strangest food you ever had on your travels and, and then, and then the, the, you know, the wackiest memory you have, maybe not the wackiest place, but something that just sticks with you from your travels. <laughs> yeah. 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 And why, and why would that be wacky? I don't know. I always struggle with these kinds of questions, like the strangest food I had. I mean, so it's funny you mentioned like, you know, the, the, was it flavor profiles or something that, that was interesting to me because I feel like as a kid, I grew up like pretty limited, you know, I had a pretty, pretty, you know, all American kind of diet in the sense that I was having fast food a couple, three times a week, you know, and really did not, you know, enjoy a lot of international flavors because I'd never had them, you know, until I was maybe a late teenager and started traveling some more. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know if I have like a strangest food, you know, I guess yeah. I, like what is strange, right? Like what, you know, what's strange True. to one person is not to, to another. Um, um, but yeah, I did kind of realize at a certain point, oh, you know, when I was eight years old, I was having Fruit Loops all the time. And when I'm 28, as you said, probably not, not the best, you know, strategy or whatever, the best uh, approach. Um, <laughs> but I really gained, a, I really gained an appreciation for South Asian food in particular, you know, anything that's Indian or Pakistani, Bangladeshi, like I, that's probably my go-to. I could eat that three meals a day these days. I don't get a chance to do it nearly as much as I would like. Um, that's not really strange, but that's, a, that's something that became very normal and, and good for me. In terms of like the wackiest memory and such, I don't know. I kind of, I had this bus ride that I took that has really st stood out to me. And I remember uh, even what was happening, I was like, I'm never going to have a bus ride like this again. It was um, something like a 35 hour bus ride through East Africa. <laughs> um you know starting in let's see where was it i was i ended up in dar es salaam i think i started in uganda actually we were talking about uganda earlier so it's kampala to dar es salaam so it went through nairobi and you know it just it it changed buses multiple times and um we had like a i don't know spiritual exorcism that took place on the bus at one point <laughs> uh which was probably helpful in keeping the bus like running i'm not sure you know um sure and then my favorite part of it, well, not the favorite part, but something I thought was interesting was like in the first hour on the bus, like they passed out some like peanuts and they passed out like a soft drink. And then like a, you know, a few more minutes goes by and they passed out some ice cream. And I was like, wow, this is a, this could be a nice bus ride. And then nothing for the next 35 hours. It's like everything, <laughs> everything is front loaded. <laughs> and so you got to know that going into it, apparently. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I met some interesting people and you know, felt like I was like, I think I was the only foreigner there. And you have the overland border border crossings, you know, a couple of different times from Uganda into Kenya and then Kenya to Tanzania and didn't sleep a whole lot. Um, but it's very, like even, you know, my friend Gretchen Rubin has this thing about the things that go wrong make the best memories. And it's not like something went terribly wrong there, but it was just a very long journey. And, you know, even though parts of it were not pleasant, I'm like... Yeah, that was a really, I'm glad I had that experience. I'm really, I don't want to do it again necessarily, but I'm really glad that I had 
that uh, experience. So that's probably just one of many memories. Yeah, I mean that's mm. a thirty-five hour African bus ride. I could, I could, mm. I, I could see that. Um, that mm. that you know, uh, but it's those things. Your your friend, what mm -hmm. was her name again? Uh, Gretchen Rubin. Yeah, she's another author. Gretchen. Yeah, she. Um, I mean, that is so good. I, I know another uh, author friend of mine says the adventure starts when things stop going as planned. Um, you know, oh, it good. kind of falls into that. But it is those things that you remember. And I, I, you know, one of the 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 common themes here that I talk about often is that um, you you tend to remember more. Um, the little lady who makes you the espresso on the back side mm -hmm. street of uh, Ethiopia. Then you mm -hmm. do the architecture of that beautiful uh, mm -hmm. painting and the museum. And, and, and it's mm -hmm. those experiences that do, do stick with you. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement there. Um, Elizabeth Hauk. All right. Gretchen wrote the happiness project. She says she's awesome. So thanks for tuning in mm -hmm. Elizabeth from Santa Fe. Cool. Um, awesome. I think Elizabeth, you, 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 um, when, when, we, when you got the email about, uh, Chris being on the show today, you wrote me back and said, you've been, have you been to every WDS? <laughs> she says, hi. That's darling. awesome. Hey, Elizabeth. I've been to every WDS myself. Uh -huh. Pretty cool, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, yeah. I, let, let's talk about WDS. Let's, let's mm -hmm. pull ourselves back from, um, from Africa to sure. Portland. How did that start? Mm -hmm. And how do you feel like it's yeah. got to be a little bit dejecting that 2020 and, and what's happening with mm. 2021? Yeah. Uh, so WDS, for those who don't know, it's the World Domination Summit. Uh, it's a gathering that I host every summer in Portland, Oregon for, you know, awesome people like those who are tuning in here. Just awesome creative people who are interested in travel or entrepreneurship or living life differently, whatever that looks like, you know, for them. Um, and it got started when I think my first book was coming out. And I went to all 50 states to meet my readers, whoever they might be. And in some cases, that was like five people, you know, in North Dakota. Um, and I went to, so I went to every state. I went to every province in Canada. And I kept meeting all these interesting people. And I was like, it would be really cool if we could bring people together, not just from, from Kansas or New Brunswick, you know, in one place, but like from all these places, you know, and have a, you know, exchange of ideas. And we'll have talks and we'll have meetups and maybe we'll do something kind of fun or adventurous. Uh, together. And so I had published a manifesto called A Brief Guide to World Domination. And I was like, let's call it the World Domination Summit. Um, and so I really didn't know anything at all about running events, um, which was quite comical in some ways, you know, it's a whole industry and I didn't have, didn't really have any understanding of that. Um, but that also kind of worked to our benefit. I can't just say me also, there's a small team that really, you know, kind of came together to make that happen. That also, even though it was comical, it also worked to our benefit because we did some things differently than what you know anybody else was doing, and it did help us to kind of like create a bit of a like an identity around that that event. Um, so I guess about 400 people or so came that first year, and then um, second year we moved to a larger theater, and we've just been doing it every ever uh, every summer since, um, uh, except not the summer of 2020, and uh, now also we decided that we're going to um, to further defer the 2021 event uh, until next year. So it is a little bit dejecting, but it's also, um, I mean, it is what it is. You know, it's like, I don't have any control over that experience. And so for me, the number one pandemic lesson has been, you know, understand what you have control over and what you don't. And it's a very small percentage, like of things that you actually have control or influence over. over. And if you can actually let go of the 97% um, of other things, maybe not let go of them, but just realize like, oh, I can't do anything about this you know, then you you tend to be a little bit happier. At least that's been my experience. Uh, so I look forward to doing it again as soon as we're able to do it. Uh, and hopefully before then, I'll also be able to do another book tour or something. Because I was going to do that last year also and wasn't able to. <sighs> yeah. So would love to love to get out and meet more people. Meet more people. Well, let's go back a, a, a couple of years and bring back the memory yeah. and sh share with the, some of the people online. And all for right. those of you who are who are watching YouTube too, by the way, there'll be links for all of the stuff. We, we, we're chatting with... Uh, with people, but 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 it'll all be in the description below for those of you on the replay. But this is um World Domination Summit highlight from 2019 that I found online. Mm. Yeah, so we'll awesome. see. Mm. WDS has made me more courageous. There isn't anything that I can't share. 
every year is different, but I know that whatever I was looking for will show up. we want by saving time. We build the lives we want, and then time saves itself. Your best moments in life are not going to be coming from when you get a reward, but from when you see the possibilities for your future life expanding. Oh, what? That felt magical. <laughs> Where do you find wonder after you've lost it? And the answer for me was to find it in the daily business of living. When we embrace our flaws and our scars and our awkwardness, they become our superpowers. So, thanks that for sharing that, man. Yeah. Oh, I feel a lot of things. I feel a lot of things. Thank yeah. you for for, for uh, sharing that with people. I hope hope people enjoyed it, and I wish we could do it next week. I wish we could all kind of hang out next week, but hopefully it'll happen. Yeah, it's funny. I don't ever go back and look at stuff. You know, like I don't. I've never read my old books. I don't listen. I don't watch my talks. I ever. I for something like that. Like you know, there's a really smart production team that makes those trailers, and I'll watch it like one or two times. You know when it's mm -hmm. done and then you know two years go by and I, I don't ever see it again so when i have one of these experiences where it's like oh i now i'm i'm actually watching it i, I do kind of re-experience um, the whole thing and it makes me remember um you know one how much work it is you know to do that kind of thing um but then two how much how worth it it is you know it's so, it's so rewarding uh, to be able to whether it's an event like that or, or something else you know there's lots of ways to bring people together um, it's really rewarding to just kind of recognize the value in in individuals' lives and to consider how you know our lives as individuals can connect to one another and, and hopefully you know create something that's that's you know better for for everyone. So yeah, I miss it. Yeah, in in for me watching it, and I've you know unfortunately if it seems I've every summer that I make you know that I want to go to it, mm. I find myself in another country. Um, well, you're in China or it, something. I suppose that's understandable. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, Lee Marvin chimes in over here. He says that, well, I guess, based on our food conversation, he says, Azerbaijan mm. mutton stew followed by the dancing cockroach on the table and then okay. dining in Russia. <laughs> All right. I think he, he wins that one. He, he wins. Yeah. I mm. had some good. I was in Azerbaijan in 2019. I had some some good food mm. there. Upset. Good mm. wine, too, actually. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, so um, c coming back to your body of work and your, you know, your, your, your philosophy to, to kind of creating a life that you want, right. You know, by, mm -hmm. once you make that decision, you, um, you spent quite a bit of time, as you were just saying, traveling the world, uh, the country in Canada, talking mm -hmm. to entrepreneurs, um, mm -hmm. small business entrepreneurs. Um, and, and eventually the, those interviews ended up becoming, uh, the, the, the outline, I guess, for the hundred dollar startup. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, for, for those of us watching those on the replay in a nutshell, how can you start a business with just a hundred bucks? Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, that was the second discovery of that tour. The first one was like, we should bring all these people together. And yeah. the second one was there's all, there's all these interesting people out there in middle America or elsewhere who don't really identify with the Silicon Valley model of entrepreneurship or the shark tank model getting investors and all that kind of stuff and they might not even think of themselves as like capital e entrepreneurs um but they found a way to make a good living for themselves you know by doing something that they that they enjoy 
So it's not just like following your passion, it's following the right kind of passion that then, you know, connects to something that's valuable for other people. And so, I mean, I, in that book, I shared all these stories of, of people who'd started their business for a hundred dollars or less, or sometimes a bit more, but not a lot of money. And um, I mean, ultimately it comes down to solving problems, you know, looking for a prop or, you know, creating a solution to a problem or maybe sometimes doing something, offering a pretty simple service or creating a product that doesn't exist. And there's lots of different, you know, avenues for doing that. That's what I try to kind of explore with the, the podcast um, that I do every day. Um, lots of different, you know, potential pathways and such, but ultimately it is about how can I, in a short period of time without, you know, spending a lot of resources, create some kind of offer that goes out into the world or to people that I know, and then how do they respond to that? And then what do I then do, you know, after, after that, essentially. Yeah. And you, you have, um, so, so from the hundred dollar startup that that's, that's mm. in, in a sense, one way to say, okay, may, maybe not quit my job and I'm, I'm, I'm mm. going to start this business, but, but it is starting the business and that's yeah. going to be the full, the full-time gig. But yet then yeah. you, then you evolved into, um, and, and we can talk a little bit about the happiness of pursuit. Um, and, and, and then you had another book in there, um, that, uh, let me go to my little, um, you know, the the born for this book, right? Mm -hmm. Where you where you you know, I guess recognize the passion, and and then then you you move into the hustle, the side hustle, right? Mm -hmm. Which is still, you know, if you've got a corporate gig, you know, you need to, it mm -hmm. brings in good money, but maybe it doesn't fulfill all your financial or at least emotional needs mm -hmm. that a yeah. side hustle can kind of sit in, which, mm -hmm. which is a, a lot of what you talk about also on the, uh, on mm -hmm. the podcast. And, and it seems that's a, a, a great framework. And in the side hustle, you, you literally say you can do this. You can create an income generating, um, business on the side, which, which eventually mm -hmm. could come full time yep. in just 20, what is it? 28 days, 27 days. Yeah, I think it was 27. I, I had like 28, but that didn't sound good. I couldn't come up with the 28th step. So I was like, let's call it 27, <laughs> you know? Let's go with that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the point of that was of side hustle is, um, you know, I felt like there was a lot of people out there who um, didn't want to quit their jobs. You know, like, like, I can't quit my job. This sounds great, but I, I can't leave right now. Or actually, I like my job. You know, I'm working for a good company or organization or I'm doing something that's like, I feel like I'm part of something. You know, I, I thought about my mom who has worked for NASA or as a contractor for, for NASA for a number of years and like, if you want to be a rocket scientist, you don't freelance, you know, you got to be part of something and that's okay. Um, but yet a lot of these people also recognize that, you know, they need to create economic security for themselves and, you know, they're, nobody's going to ever care about their well-being as much as, as they will. And, you know, we've seen so many companies experience layoffs and entire industries change and such. And then also, like you mentioned, emotional needs, like, uh, you know, doing your side project can open up a whole different creative outlet and such. And so I felt like I want to really kind of try to reach those people who I think are a little bit excluded from uh, the entrepreneurial conversation because so much of the conversation is about like why you should quit your job, you know? And I mean, I'm partially responsible for that in like a small way myself. So it felt <laughs> bad. Um, and I, I just felt like this is, this is something that people need to hear. And I think it came out at the right time, you know, for that. So that's, that's been fun. I get stories, a lot, a lot of stories from people who've been able to like start different projects and, such and it's always fun to hear like when there's some intersection between things yeah yeah um i'm sorry lee i i do remember that you're a, you're a woman that's just that when i think of lee it's like i said he <laughs> but mm. lee yes i'm sorry um anyway the mutton stew mm. is still going to be thinking about that when i think about <laughs> lee now <laughs> um yeah so so the that 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 emotional reward. I, I remember another um, thing that I took away from one of your writings, um, and, and it's and it's probably in multiple areas where you talk about um, lottery fantasies. You know, people have, mm. will have lo lottery fantasies, and that you know you mm -hmm. can win if you win a lot of money. But but you 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 use a a, a story where or or or, or just uh, you connect with the fact that you're going to be a, um, feel a lot better for something that mm. you've created as opposed to yeah. something that's in your lap. And that, that, that fantasy, that euphoria you get, if you did win the lottery goes away pretty quick. Whereas mm. as 
doing something on your own and creating that uh, will will reward you a lot, you know, a lot further down the road. Yeah. I mean, if you win the lottery, you know, nice work if you can get it, you know, I don't mean, really mean to discourage that, but, um, you know, most people are not going to win the lottery. So I think there's a lot of power in, you know, like the example of like buying a lottery ticket and never checking the winning numbers, you know, like you buy this lottery ticket and just imagine it's the winner, but you never actually go and look, you know, it's like you're, exp you're expressing your autonomy over that. And you're saying there's something I can do that is better, as you said, like I can, I can win my own lottery. I can figure out what is it that I want in life and, and you know, what is it that I really want in life? Not what I have necessarily been conditioned to want or what I thought I wanted or what I really did want at one time, but now I'm a different person or what, you know, just really getting intentional about that. And, you know, then understanding there's probably more than one way to accomplish it. You know, it's probably more than one way, you know, to, to get whatever that, whatever that is. And, and, um, yeah, I mean, if you do it yourself, you're going to feel better about it. And it doesn't have to be like some big lofty thing either, right? It can just be something small in the beginning. You know, what do you, what do you want to do tomorrow? What are you expected to do tomorrow? And what do you really want to do? And if there's some gap between those two things, you know, what, what change can you make? Even if it's a small change to get closer to the thing that you actually really want to do. And I think once you start thinking about this and like internalizing it, um, then it's, it's hard to go back. You know, it's hard to go back because it's very like self-reinforcing in the sense that you're like, wow, I did make a choice to align myself a little bit more with uh, what I really want to do. And that feels good. So how else can I do that? You know, how can I do that in my relationships? How can I do that in my career? How can I do that in my plans? You know, both my future plans and also my like spontaneous, you know, plans, if you will, or like, how am I going to spend this particular day or this moment? Um, it's a really powerful thing. I mean, it's, it's changed my life. Sure. You know, I want to talk a bit about the writing process because um, so many of your books from from Art of Nonconformity to the $100 Startup and, and the Hustle books are all real mm -hmm. stories about real people that you've met. And in Art of Nonconformity, mm -hmm. it's, it's really about a lot about you um, mm -hmm. uh, going from a FedEx uh, worker to, <laughs> to an eBay yeah. salesman and then, and then look where you are now. But in the money tree, you took a different mm. approach and it's more of a mm. parable. Um, yeah. and, and you've created this character, Jake and mm -hmm. Jake is having, you know, uh, I mean, this is a side hustle kind of a uh, book, a story, a side hustle story. Mm -hmm. Um, and Jake uh, finds, you know, in his own backyard, a mentor and Clarence mm -hmm. who, who actually, I, I feel like he's Clarence is a good composite of you in many ways. And some of the work you've done, um, you know, that's just me, mm -hmm. my, my observation. I, I, I'm there. And, and I'm sure Jake is a composite of so many people you've met all over the world as you've worked in your other projects. Um, mm -hmm. How was it that for the process for you as a, as a writer to move from um, a, a classically nonfiction kind of style yep. of telling stories to writing fiction mm -hmm. with a strong mm -hmm. message? I, it was so much fun. I, I loved it. I really enjoyed the process. Uh, I had never wanted to write a novel before. I never thought I could. Like I, I, I thought of it as a completely different, you know, a completely different field with different skills. And like, how does one learn to do that? You know. And I guess I, I kind of learned I, after I had the idea. I had this initial idea about these characters and wasn't quite sure where it was going to go. But I started thinking through what is that? What is that story? And how can I use that story to teach some of the same concepts that I've been teaching elsewhere? Hopefully, in a way that is then approachable and. You know, for somebody who's not going to go out and read a business book, you know, how can I make it entertaining so that you can read this book and enjoy it, but also learn something? Uh, I mean, so it was a different process, but it was really a lot of fun to dive into. And um, I mean, I, I wish I had been able to go out on tour and talk about it more. So mm -hmm. perhaps at some point there'll be a paperback version and I can I can do that. Um, but I definitely learned a lot, you know, along the way. I mean, with with non, it's like you have different problems. You have some things are easier and some things are harder, right? Like with nonfiction, it's like everything has to be factually correct, you know, and with its fiction, you're making up the story. So it's whatever you want. Right. All right. But then that also like, you know, creates challenges of its, of its own, you know, cause it has to be believable. It has to kind of like all tie up and such. Um, but nonfiction, it's like, you decide, here's what I need to teach. There's, there's not that many ways to, to teach it, you know, like, so it's your creativity is in style and like delivery. Whereas with fiction, it's like wide open. There's so many different things you could do. You have to kind of create some artificial constraints 
uh, for yourself. At least I found that for, for me. So you don't end up writing a you know 800 page book that no publisher is going to want and no reader is going to want to read. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, did you have any resistance from from the publisher with that with the proposal with the idea? Yep, absolutely. Um, and we talked to a number of publishers. And I heard from, I mean, several of them were like, we really like Chris, you know, we'd like to, we'd love to work with Chris on some, so they're all, whenever they start saying that, you know, it's not a good thing, right? <laughs> We'd love to work with Chris, um, you know, on something else, right? I mean, and actually a couple of publishers said to, to my literary agent, uh, they're like, does Chris have anything else? Like, does he have it? Like, does he have another, I'm like, do I have another book in my pocket? Like, how does that work? Like, it's just one book, you know, this is what I'm doing right now. Um, <laughs> so no, there was, that, that, exactly, you know what I mean? Like, how do you, how, <laughs> I don't know what they, what they expect. Oh, actually, yes. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, here's the 300 page book on productivity that I forgot to, to mention or something, you know, but um, <laughs> fortunately, I mean, fortunately, you know, what, you know, the publisher that I ended up working with really did understand the vision and I'm very grateful for that. Um, uh, so we were able to, to move forward with it. Yeah, because you do. It's 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 kind of fun. You weave in pop culture things. You know, we've got kombucha in there. You know, contemporary things. We've got uh, mm -hmm. hip hop artists in there. We've got uh, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of lot of coffee. A lot of coffee in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, there, but um, maybe briefly, because for for people know, you know, everybody mm -hmm. is always looking. You know, they say money doesn't grow on trees, and mm. in, in in the money tree, and, and there actually is a money tree, right? You, you yes. tell, tell us about the yep. real money tree, and then tell us the the metaphorical money tree and how how it relates in in this story. Right? Of yes, the real money tree. I forget the the Latin name for it, uh, but yes, it's colloquially known as the as the money tree. It's hard to care for, actually. Surprisingly, I I had a money tree when I when the book was coming out. I was like, oh, I should have a money tree here here. You know. In my little space, and sadly, the, the that money tree died, you know, in a couple of weeks. But that's a reflection on me, not the tree. Um, and I think what I'm talking about in the book is the concept of of, of planting seeds. You know, of planting seeds. What what are investments that you can make in yourself? What little project can you start? You know, without again, without spending a lot of money and such. You know, th there is something that everybody can do. Everybody is an expert at something. There's a way to unlock that knowledge and then package it and sell it in some some form, so many ways these days. Anybody can start a podcast. Anybody can have a blog, YouTube channel, TikTok. You've got so many other things. Um, or you can go into the world of products. You can learn how to buy and resell. And and like as you do this stuff, um, you know, it's like a, it can be like, it can be like a hobby, but you're getting paid for it. You know, it's like instead of golf, you know, and everything that it costs to play golf or whatever your hobby is, video games, anything else, it's something that actually ends up being financially rewarding. And so I think it's really just fun to, to explore that. So planting seeds and, you know, hopefully having an investment in the future, um, you know, creating that source, that, that income source that's going to serve you for lots of things. Yeah, you um, you also, you know, one of the things in, in your writings, you say that, um, you know, starting your own business or starting your own side hustle is not about um, working less it's about working more mm. but that's because you're enjoying it more i think mm. you allude, allude to that which yeah is great. Well, hopefully it's like working better you know it's working better it's like yeah more more hours you know for better return and not just financial return right it's ultimately it's about meaning it's about meaning and purpose and and for me mm. like i have i like to work i like i like what i do i feel very fortunate you know if i could that whole thing about time and money, like if time was you know if you had all the money in the world what would you do and i'm, I'm pretty sure it would be very similar to what i'm doing now and I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. That's the goal, right? For anybody who's watching, like whatever it is you want to do, even if you're like, I don't care about entrepreneurship. I don't care about travel. It's, well, what do you care about? You know, what do you care about? And that's the goal is to have a, have alignment, you know, in those things. And if you can do what you enjoy and it makes the world a better place or at least helps somebody in some way, then, you know, like what else is there? Why wouldn't you want to do more of it? I guess that's why for me, I work every day. I, you know, I'm always working on stuff and that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, if, if you're not, this is a, a, something that always drives me crazy. People that stay in jobs mm. that they don't like, and they're, they're, mm. they're, they're, they're frustrated and they hope that the money's good. And I'm like, right, that, right. yeah, that's not, that's not it. It's not a good answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to, what are you going to retire and uh, be, you know, have all this money and now you're going to be old and you're not going to be able to climb uh, Kilimanjaro. Yeah. Or, right. Know, right. Trek trek the camino whatever it is you want to do yeah mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing chris that i um for people that 
this watching this webcast uh, will be new to is that you're not just writing business books that you mm. hope people absorb through uh, osmosis or they'll get their highlighter <laughs> out. <laughs> um, mm. You provide a lot of resources and tools. You've been doing this since your first book and mm. the money tree is, is no different. Um, first of all, you've got a manifesto. This is the third mm. way. And I want to talk about mm. that. And then you have, um, you know, because a lot of people get together and read in groups and you've got this mm -hmm. reading group guide, which gives people some real tangible and actionable things that they can do to get out mm -hmm. of this. And and I'm, I'm really I'm impressed. I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't be. You're Chris Gillibo, but yeah. you are doing yeah. um, really one of the other things is that you say is is creating a life you want, but also helping mm -hmm. others. It's the most important mm -hmm. thing, you know, you have to live yeah. a life of service, too. Talk mm, to me about, sure. about the third way. You alluded to it a minute ago. Mm. Um, and, mm. you know, some of these, you know, for those watching that, you know, maybe this inspires them. You know, I could use another mm. two, three, four grand a month because mm -hmm, I want to mm -hmm. travel more or I do want to uh, go back to college. I do want to do whatever yeah. it is. Well, I mean, I think. On this point about helping others, it's good to just point out that there's nothing sacrificial about it. You know, it's not like it's not like uh, you're you're giving so much of yourself, and there's a big cost, you know, to you with that. Like, I feel like by helping others, like you yourself are going to be better. And like, you know, I have been helped throughout my life by so many people, and whenever I am able to do something that, that hopefully is helpful, then it, it feels good, right? So it's not it's like a very positive, again, self reinforcing, you know, kind of cycle. So. I'm, um, yeah, a lot of those resources are all available for free. I try to do 80 to 90% of my work for free, uh, which is one of these great benefits of the, the internet economy, you know, that we, that we have in the sense that, you know, it's a podcast that goes out every day. It's supported by advertisers. So people listen to like a little 30 second pitch, but then they get the whole content, you know, for free, which is great. Um, and the same with the books, the books are pretty low cost, you know, 20 bucks, you know, for this whole book or whatever. Um, but then you can also get these resources. I think it's moneytreebook.com that has uh, some that reading guide and various other things, uh, or just my main website. There's lots of different tools and such. I think the manifesto is just like uh, the third way manifesto was like a, a way to like encapsulate some of these some of these concepts in just a really like short, pithy kind of form. So you could remember here's how you start the business, here's how you understand your expertise. You know, here are some guidelines and parameters um, that might be that might be helpful to you. Yeah, the, it, 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 it is very good. And I can see, especially in a group setting, you've, you've got people, people that are looking for ideas. Um, you know, you've got the, 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 the 100 Side Hustles book really does have mm -hmm. some concrete ideas. It's not so, so conceptual and, mm -hmm. and gives, gives that, gives you some concrete ideas. And then Side Hustle itself is more, you know, you, you, you talk about, I mean, you talk about the money tree even in, in, in Side Hustle as well. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's why I say this body of work, if you're looking for um, you know, to, to, to do more and be more rewarding, you know, you talk about a, a woman in, in Money Tree who makes dollhouses, you know, there's a jewelry mm -hmm. maker. Um, people, right. you know, it, it's it's not necessarily the Etsy generation, but the, but the Etsy is, mm -hmm. is a, a certain, mm -hmm. certainly gave sure. a lot of doors open for. Uh, Absolutely, for sure. I mean, it's a place where anybody can go and list something for sale, which is very powerful. You know, even if you're not going to be a millionaire from selling stuff on Etsy, it, if you've never sold anything before at all, like you've never received a PayPal payment from a stranger, the first time that happens, it feels pretty good, you know, and it kind of maybe gives you a little bit of a boost and like, okay, maybe I can make my own website next. And maybe there's a way that I could, you know, grow this even further or not, you know, you can, I mean, that's the whole point, right? You do what's, what's, what's good for you. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine not long ago, as I know, who, uh, you know, I, I think I suggested or somebody else had suggested he does some things on YouTube, you know, it's not a big channel, it's, it's, it's there. And he, and he started, you know, I said, you should put some affiliate links there, you know, on stuff you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, he, you know, out of the blue one day, he got a, um, uh, a check or a deposit mm -hmm. on his, um, it came over on a screen of something like, you know, $13. And he's like, I've never been so mm -hmm. happy about $13 right. in my right. life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, I mean, he I, hear that, I hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, it feels like, I, I mean, I get $13 payments for stuff sometimes and I'm excited about it, you know? 
Um, yeah. it, it's a, it's a weird psychological well, thing, but, um, but again, it, it feels very empowering. Yeah. And, and it's that, um, you know, the other thing I think all of us would love to have is, is the, that whole notion of passive income so that, mm-hmm. you know, while you're sleeping, uh, those, those notifications are coming across your screen, which, which is, which is a good thing, but you got to be purposeful for that and, and, mm-hmm. and work that. And I think your books do yeah. um, a good job to help that. Um, mm-hmm. I, um, I, can we keep you on just a little bit more? I want to show another video. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I've also put up, and for those of you, um, uh, links to the moneytreebook.com will be in the description, as well as Chris Gillibau's website, also The Art of Nonconformity. All of those links are there. And right now on mm-hmm. the offers, if you haven't seen it, it's been up there. Um, you can go to Chris's Amazon uh, author page and see all the books mm-hmm. that he's written. And we're going to play a trailer right now for for one we haven't really talked much about, which is called Born for This. So let me play this video and we'll talk about it on the other side, Chris. Cool. All throughout life, we have to make these really big decisions with limited information. And so you go to college and you're like, you have to select this major that's going to then determine your first job and your career. And maybe you want to change at some point, but is it too late? What to do? What to change to? How do we find the work that we were born to do? I think that when people are doing work that they're not created for, it's incredibly draining. Everything feels draining. Uh, They're more stressed. They're more worried. They don't feel like they're getting things done. And so that energetic, emotional drain happens because something isn't in line. Most people who made really big changes, there were very few mistakes that they couldn't recover from. Even if it was a total dead end, you can usually turn around and then do something else. If someone had said to me two weeks prior to my getting the call from the mayor, I would have just fallen down laughing because it was so different from what I was doing. What I wanted to accomplish, I get a chance to do that every single day with the resources of a municipality. It felt like, I get to make money from this? I still have days where I'm like, don't tell anyone because I'm getting away with something. I'm getting away with doing something that is so important. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And I knew that the only wrong decision was sitting still in my sales job and continuing to do the same old thing. We spend so much of our lives working and I knew that I didn't want to spend my whole life stuck in a job that I hated. So I knew that even if I traveled all across the country, worked a job in every state, that I'd only be 50 steps closer to finding a job that I really enjoyed and that I love doing. I think trying to find this work you were born to do is the most important thing you can do for your career. I've seen how happy people can be when they truly find or create their dream job, when they win the career lottery. So I've tried to provide all the tools and resources, all kinds of specific exercises you can use to help you find the work you were born to do. I know that's uh, that's a few years old, but it's it's perfectly yeah. relevant. Another throwback, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, that's fun. That's fun. Yeah. So that book is uh, the goal with that book is specifically to help people understand in the first place. You know, do you want to be an entrepreneur? Or do you want to fit into uh, you know a corporate structure, but in a way that still allows you know for your individuality and and for you to develop you know, to your highest potential and how can you think entrepreneurially in the context of a non-entrepreneurial setting, if that's your, your choice. Uh, so yeah, I remember I did a lot of research for that book and, and like developed a model of, um, you know, a combination of like joy, money and flow about, you know, the, the ideal career, whether it's, you know, working for yourself or working for someone else, it has the right balance of, of joy or happiness, or like pleasure and money, that thing that's self-sustaining, and flow, which is the thing that you're really good at, right? So you want to do something that has all three of those things, you know, as much as possible. And sometimes in life, you're kind of leaning toward more one or the other. And, you know, if you've got a lot of bills to pay, you're in debt, you've got, you got to think a little bit about that money elements. And maybe you're, for a time, you're working somewhere that's not your dream job. Um, but, you know, hopefully over time, that's going to shift to get more and more centered around all three. Yeah, it, 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 it 
it, it, it all comes to that, that notion, whether you are working for someone else or working for yourself mm. is, is enjoying the work that you do. Uh, I had a guest on here. I don't know if you know, um, uh, Steve Farber, um, and he has this uh, saying, which is very gillibo esque ask if I can coin that word. And I'm going to I'm going to pull it up in a second so I don't uh, bastardize it because it, it's it's um, it's pretty good. He's a leadership uh, mm. speaker and, and he's got a whole leadership uh, program. But um, let's do this. Uh, this is how we do. We're very organic on the Journeys webcast. Everything kind of mm. flow, making a flow. That's great. Okay. Okay. See, I'll find this pretty good. Um, do what you love in the service of people who love what you do is his mm. thing. It's, 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 it's simple. It's catchy. It's, it's yep. good, but, okay. but, but, but that's what, that's what you want. He's like, you said, you want to bring in that, mm. you, you, you need that joy. Um, there. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to go back to our chat to see if anybody had any questions. You've been kind of quiet there. Mm -hmm. I, I hope we're, we're, we're engaging you. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, we, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to that. If not, I'm going to keep, I've got a couple more things I wanted to, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to highlight about, um, about Chris. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of come back to this manifesto because there's a couple things re relate okay. to what, what we were just talking about, but I'm going to just uh, to give people watching and on the replay a, a little bit about um, this, this notion of the third way. And I won't say exactly mm. what the third way is, but I'm going to go what the, the, the key highlights of the third way is, is the, the points that you make. Everyone's an expert at something. Okay. Then you go mm. from idea to product or service, depending on what you're going to do. Spend as little money as possible mm -hmm. for launch before you're ready, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is which is always a tough one, you know. If you're a bit of a perfectionist, sure. um, improve yeah. as improve as you go. This is part of the mm -hmm. third way, and and in mm -hmm. in their book, and I'll share that I prove that I really did read this. There there is an organization that helps young entrepreneurs or people looking to bring an extra income stream that get together on a weekly mm. basis, like a reading group, except these guys share their ideas and help each other with their side hustle. Mm. And it's called the third way. Um, tell mm -hmm. us what is the third way and how, mm -hmm. um, how come it's, it's, it's important, especially to somebody either looking to reduce debt, maybe get an extra mm -hmm. income stream or otherwise have more mm -hmm. freedom. Yeah. Awesome. Um, the thing about being a, perfectionist. Uh, well, first, I should say, if somebody does have a question, let me know. Feel free to pop it in the, the chat because um, I do have to go in a, in, a, in a moment or two, but I want to make sure I don't leave before any, you know, we answer any questions. Um, the thing about being a perfectionist is if you if you are one, you're never going to launch anything, right? So the definition of launch before you're ready, like something is never really going to be perfect. And and you only get the information that you need by actually like you know putting it out there and such. Um, so that's why I encourage people to, to think about that. But the third way that comes about from, um, you know, earlier we were talking about uh, $100 startup. You know, I, I wrote that book out of an awareness that there were a lot of people who were being overlooked. Um, you know, the, tr the traditional way of starting a business, if we go back even like before the startup world, is you need to go to the bank and borrow some money. Or maybe you put it all on your credit cards, or maybe you borrow it from your parents or from someone. But the point is, somebody you know who has access to resources needs to agree to give you those resources, and then you're taking a lot of risk because if you're opening a retail store, you know you won't find out for a year or two, perhaps you know if that store is even going to going to be profitable. It could be longer. Um, so the the stakes are kind of high. And then the second way is the startup way or the Silicon Valley way of you're also looking for investors. You also are hoping that somebody is going to, um, you know, bestow their blessing on you, so to speak. And, you know, to find those people, you need access, to, uh, to, like finding those people is a resource of its own, right? It's kind of an elite privileged thing. You need somebody to like make introduction and such. And so the third way is, is you know, meant to be, here's the thing for everybody else. You know, here's the thing that is low risk, 
and doesn't require access, you know, to certain people or certain resources. Anybody can do it. You know, you talked about Etsy earlier. It's one of many, many options. Um, if it fails, we talked about failure as well. If it fails, then you try something else because you haven't really lost a lot of money and you've gained some experience and knowledge through that process probably. Um, and so I think this is, you know, for a lot of people at least, I think this is better. I think this is a better way. And for anybody who's like, I'm totally committed to the, you know, startup way or something, I'm like, that's great. But for all the rest of us, you know, I think this is a, this is an approach that is very relatable and, and feasible. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that for sure. Um, well, I, uh, are, are we've got quiet on the chat. So I guess the, 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 the last thing I pose out to, um, to Chris is, Final words of wisdom before we close down the the, mm -hmm. the webcast. And you know, it, it's always I always do this at the end of the webcast. It's like not putting you on the spot, but but there's always sure. something lingering or something you learned today. You know, one thing you said at the beginning mm -hmm. when we start first started talking is mm -hmm. that you made a co cognitive effort to learn something new in this kind of new environment of the pandemic. And one of the mm -hmm. things that's been a theme of mine, and I've talked about it on several of these shows, is that in, especially in the beginning and the height of the, the the lockdowns that we've all experienced, how many people were complaining, whether it's about mm. you know not wearing a mask or not being able to do something. Mm. And I always said that if you just change your perspective a bit and don't look at what mm -hmm. you're losing or missing, ask yourself. Yeah what you're gaining and what you're learning. And um, so that that was uh, um, something I just wanted mm -hmm. to highlight. I think that's so important. Mm. And in fact, yeah. you, you, whether you're learning more about blockchain mm. or you're <laughs> learning, you know, you know, I was learning some new songs on the guitar. You're a musician, right? Mm, it, nice. Yeah, yeah, play? I have been in the past. What Not do you really play? anything these days. I no? used to play bass, though. So I mean, it's bass and piano and keyboard and stuff. Um, not really doing a whole lot with it these days, but uh, I still have a good, you know, recollection of that. Good memories of it. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, well, coming back to the wisdom, you know, you, you've shared so much with us. Is there something that's been floating recently? A conversation, something that. Mm, okay. Well, yeah. Let's see, I, I was going to say for me, everything kind of kind of comes back to um, my overall philosophy, which is how I try to live my life and, and what I what I encourage people, you know, as well is uh, that you don't have to live your life the way others expect, you know, and all kinds of people have all sorts of expectations for you. And some of those people may even be close to you. You know, I think this is maybe this is the thing I've been thinking about more recently. It's like I used to kind of position this argument as if, you know, society, quote unquote, is, is like trying to, to pull you down. Right. And there may be some some of that, like a lot of us may experience peer pressure and such. But sometimes the the most difficult pressure to overcome, you know, can come from our family members, our close friends, people who care about us. And they're not necessarily trying to bring us down, right? They're not our enemies, but they have their own ideas, you know, for how for what we should do and and how we should act and you know what kind of career we should be in and all all this kind of stuff. And so I think. The, the courage to overcome that and to, to be able to say, you know what, I want to do something for, for myself and I'm going to do whatever it takes to figure that out. And then I'm going to figure out what the next steps are toward it. Even if it is scary, even if it feels a little bit different than anything I've done before, I have the sense that it's going to be worth it. And so I guess what I would say is, you know, based on what I've learned myself and talked to so many other people around the world, you know, if you, if you don't take that step, you're going to look back and regret it. And if you do take that step, only good things can happen. Like only good things, basically. Like if it, it may not actually even end up being the thing that you imagine, it could be something different. Um, but you won't look back and say, oh, I wish I hadn't actually explored that question of what is it that I really want and can I overcome whatever pressure or obstacle is standing in my way. So I don't know if that's wisdom, but I, I thank you for the conversation and everybody who's watching now or anybody who's watching in the replay. Um, it's been, been really enjoyable. Yeah, it has been. And, and Phyllis Evan just popped in. She says, hi, late, but better late than not at all. So hey, Phyllis, Phyllis, you'll, you'll get a link to the, um, to the replay because this has been a great conversation. Um, mm. and, uh, I'm, um, I'm glad that you came in. It's, it's always good to be here mm. rather than not at all. And, and amen to the, uh, the notion of, you know, we only really, you know, for the most part, regret what we, um, mm. 
you know, the, the saying, you always forget what you didn't do rather than what you do. Mm-hmm. Which is, yeah. which I, I, I think that is great wisdom. I'm going to uh, mm-hmm. play the little closing video and we'll say goodbye at the other side. Thank you for tuning in to the Journeys webcast. I'm Alan Carl, your host. Be sure to tune us in every Monday. The time changes depending on where we are in the world. This is Alan Carl, and where will your next journey take you? Chris, thank you so much for... uh... Dude, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it, man. Good conversation, smart questions, and got some great, great viewers out there. Yeah, yeah, a lot of lot of thank you all for tuning in. We'll be back mm-hmm. next week. So, uh, mm-hmm. and the replay, we'll you'll go. You guys who came in late had to leave early. All will get that in the in the email. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Chris. We I hope I, we'll see you face to face next time. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, everybody. Okay, Appreciate it. Bye.